Everybody put this. We're out there trying to empty those in the corn lane. The Corvette. All right. I think one of Thank you all for joining us as we. Yeah, I'll hold okay, up just okay. a second. Okay. Thank you all for joining us this week. We are celebrating National Estuaries Week and it's a nationwide celebration of our estuaries. So we're fresh and saltwater meat and all the benefits they provide. And today we're extremely excited. We've got Rick O'Connor from Florida Sea Grant. He's going to talk to us about some local work that's been happening with our terrapin species. He's going to show you a couple terrapins and also um, tell you how you guys can help these guys with your crab traps if you have them or talk to your neighbors or people that have them as well. So without further ado, Rick's going to kick us off. All right. Thanks very much, Logan. Thanks everybody for coming. I will say I do work for the University of Florida at the extension office. So technically I'm a teacher and everybody's got to sign in class. So <laughs> I'll pass this around. If you guys wouldn't mind filling that out, that justifies to my boss that I'm actually working and I'm, <laughs> getting, I'm doing what they are paying me to do. Yes, it is National Estuaries Week. Uh, and so this is the only resident uh, terrapin, or turtle rather, American turtle in the United States that resident in, for the estuaries itself. So that's the title of this is Meet the Diamondback Terrapin. I started working with this animal about 15 years ago. And at that time, very, very few people knew what they were. Now, a lot of folks may have heard of them, but they had no idea what they were. Uh, unless they had relocated here from Maryland, they all know what they are there. And that's what I usually found. Somebody, oh yeah, I know what that is, but I'm from Maryland. Um, yeah, here along the Florida coast, a lot of folks had never heard of this thing. And as we get into the talk, you'll find out that's how the work actually got started. So uh, I'm going to start there. Uh-oh. Did I freeze? I freeze. Huh. I may get you to advance it. Oh, yes. there we are. Too fast. Too fast. Too fast. <laughs> All right, so there it is. That's the diamondback terrapin. For those who have never seen uh, the creature, this is it. And again, I did bring some, so I will show you one. This is the diamondback terrapin. Uh, so yeah, this is about a normal uh, uh, actual size. I mean, we, I've got to have one mallet. It's a little bit larger, but this is about standard size for a diamondback terrapin. Uh, and she does love to scratch. Uh, and anybody who wants to, to hold the... Uh, Jelly later is more than welcome to. Uh, it is in the family Myidae. Uh, there's uh, Myidae turtles are what people know as pond turtles. Folks who have lived here all their lives all are familiar with turtles you see in creeks and rivers. If you've been up on the Escambia, uh, go to a golf course, any water hole, you'll see turtles. All of those turtles belong to the family of Myidae. It's the largest family of turtles in Florida. Uh, and this one belongs to it. Also, the box turtle is actually a member of this family as well. Um, the difference between terrapins and the rest of the members of the family uh, is the skin color, number one. Well, one of the first questions that people will ask me, what's the difference between a terrapin and a turtle? And the answer is telling. Uh, in biology, they're all turtles. Everything is a turtle. All the other names you hear, tortoise, well, they're, they're cultural terms. Uh, so there's nothing science about it. Uh, so yeah, terrapin is actually a Delaware Indian word that means edible turtle. <laughs> loosely translated, and a lot of them are edible, so I don't know why aren't more of the terrapins, but they're not. But how they differ from their cousins, as you can see here from Shelly, and if you're online, you can see uh, even closer with the picture there, their skin is light. You guys have seen all these pond turtles around here. They generally have very dark skin, black, dark olive green color with some light stripes on it, usually yellow. Uh, sometimes it'll be white, sometimes you see red, you'll see a little bit of red, but you'll notice with this individual here, the skin is actually the opposite. It's sort of a whitish blue gray color and the markings are dark. Uh, Shelly here has got spots all over here. That is not Shelly, actually, that's a different turtle. Uh, but sometimes these spots can be stripes or bars. They come in different uh, um, patterns. And I'll be honest with you, and we'll get into this as we talk, this has actually become a problem for this particular turtle because folks who have never seen or met a diamondback terrapin say that is one of the coolest looking turtles. And I wrote a blog about this once because I work with a lot of turtles and it's hard to say one turtle is prettier than another. It's kind of like saying one of your children is prettier than the others. It's hard to do that. But this is one real pretty turtle. It really is. And unfortunately, because of the color, and how cool looking they are. They're extremely popular in the pet trade. There is an illegal poaching issue that goes on. So um, we are having that problem in the canyon as well. Uh, it is very lucrative in that business. So that's one difference. That's one difference. Uh, a second difference between the animal and its cousins is its terrapin's habitat. They like brackish water. Okay, all the other Amaya turtles are freshwater turtles. 
Uh, I have seen sliders and cooters both in Santa Rosa Sound. They were not supposed to be there. They were not doing well. We had to rescue them. I don't know how they got out there, but this one actually loves it. Uh, terrapins actually do pretty well in freshwater. As a matter of fact, Shelly lives in a freshwater tank. She's fine, but they prefer brackish water. And we generally find them somewhere between 10 and 15 uh, parts per thousand. Just for reference, for those who don't know, the Gulf of Mexico is about 35. So she likes it less than 35. Now, can they survive in the Gulf of Mexico? We're going to talk more about that uh, during this talk as well. Uh, research shows that in, in, uh, in full strength seawater in the Gulf of Mexico, they do pretty well for about a month and then things start shutting down. Uh, so they say about a month is about all they can tolerate. So uh, they're not sea turtles. And that is one of the problems we have with them all across the state of Florida. People will find these, as you will see a couple slide pictures, they'll see one of these things on Santa Rosa Island and they run over and they throw it in the Gulf of Mexico because the immediate thought is, you know, it's a sea turtle, all turtles are sea turtle, it's at the beach. And of course, Shelly would come screaming back and you were like, no, <laughs> you know, like, no. So this is where they want to be. Uh, they want to be in these salt marshes. And it's real interesting. I, this is when I got involved with Terrapins. One of the things I learned very quickly, we have a lot of volunteers who do sea turtle watch, okay? A lot of folks like to do that. But think about that. You're on an ATV and the sand is nice and white. You know, you're riding up and down the beach. If you're going to work with Terrapins, this is where you're going to go. You're going to go into a salt marsh. It's a really muddy bottom. There's a lot of no ceilings out there. And people are like, dude, I'm gone. I'm, I'm doing sea turtles. I don't want to do this thing. So it is a, a pretty forbidden environment in a lot of cases. Uh, but that is where you find them. Lucky, this is Lucky. Uh, we found Lucky in the Gulf of Mexico um, uh, near Navarre Beach. And you will notice uh, um, gooseneck barnacles growing all over Lucky. Uh, it, was in the, it was not doing well when it was found. It was not doing well at all. We managed to get it to a vet. It did, well, you know, it's got a happy ending. Lucky did, uh, was uh, restored, and restored, but uh, rehabilitated and then released, but uh, someone in the process knew a gooseneck barnacle expert. And I kind of <laughs> laughed when I heard like, who got one of those in their back pocket? Like, but the guy who did this actually said those gooseneck barnacles were at least 50 days old. So even that, that kind of goes again on some of the things we're going to talk about. There's a lot we don't know about here, particularly in the Florida Panhandle. But again, Lucky was doing fine. Lucky did survive, but he was in the Gulf of Mexico for at least 50 days. Uh, so they put a Preferred habitat, they don't like this. When they get in, like I said, the Gulf of Mexico, they'll come into the salt marsh. Now, you know, sea turtles, if people tag them and they travel all over the world and they come back to their nesting beaches, that kind of thing. Terrapins, they have what we call strong sight fidelity. They live here. This is where they are. And when you put a tag on them, you will find it's really boring. Oh, he moved across here. Woo, you know, that kind of thing. So they don't move a whole lot. They kind of like to live in this one marsh. That's their favorite home. Within the marsh, what they look for are the creeks. Uh, they really like some of the creeks back here. The muddier the bottom, the better, which makes it even more fun if you're a terrapin person and you got to go walk in that muck and mire. Why aren't you going to the sandy part where I can stand up? Uh, but that's where they like to be. And they'll spend most of their days just basking. Uh, they'll come up and peep. Somebody asked me just last week, will they come up on logs? Yes, if there's one provided. Uh, but in a lot of those places, they aren't. So we've actually seen them up here on the mud, just laying on the mud basking. Um, and they just spend the time there. We'll see them in the water, their heads popping up in the water. I usually see them later in the afternoon, but everybody who works with terrapins will see them different times of the day. And uh, they feed on shellfish. About the only time they leave the marsh is when it's time to breed. Uh, and this is here, you know, you're venturing up on land, it's usually gonna be close by. That is a female with a satellite tag. Um, we, that was one that we tagged this year. I'm gonna put Shell down for a second. Her name's Molly, that one. She got a name. Actually, no, I'll take that back. That's Kennedy. That one, her name's Kennedy. Uh, but as far as coming up on land, they will come up on land to bass. And like I said, they come up on the beach to lay eggs just like sea turtles do. But generally, it's going to be close by. It's rare for them to go more than five miles to find a sandy beach to, to lay their eggs. The difference, too, also from sea turtles is they like to lay their eggs in the middle of the day. And the sunnier, the better. Uh, we notice a sort of a down... Uh, size or down, uh, yeah, downsizing of, of, of nesting activity when it's a rainy or cloudy day. They really like sunny days, so that makes them a little bit different as well. Okay, they feed on shellfish. Uh, this is one of their favorites. It's the marsh periwinkle. If you've ever been out in the salt marsh, you'll see this thing go up and down. We see that's a bulk of their diet. Uh, I have actually seen terrapins and blue crabs both trying to jump out of the water to snag those things. <laughs> actually, I went to Dolphin Island Sea Lab as a student. And that, that was a study they did. So actually, 
blue crab juice in the water, they will all start, the snails I'm talking about, will all scream up the grass, you know, because mm -hmm. they know trouble's nearby. Uh, so yeah, both blue crabs and terrapins are trying to get those things. So that's why they go up the grass, is to avoid predation. And at low tide, they come back down and they start feeding on all the muck and mire and getting all the organics off of that. So a terrapin could still pull them off. Uh, Shelly eats a lot of shrimp. We keep her at the Roy Hyatt Environmental Center in a 175-gallon aquarium there, and she eats a lot of shrimp. She really loves it. So my thought is that they would eat shrimp if they could catch them. I don't know how <laughs> they are. You know, so this thing is easier to catch. That's what I'm going to be. Uh, but it is shellfish. They do prey on, on shellfish. Uh, here is the distribution. We're going to come back to this one uh, of where the terrapins live in the United States. Uh, the east, as you can see here, the east and the Gulf Coast of the United States. But you'll notice a blink right there. This is U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and that leads into what the Panhandle Terrapin Project is really all about. Now, why is that blank there? Is that if you go back to the 1860s, 1870s, and start following all the literature on terrapins, there has not been one published uh, article about terrapins in the Panhandle. So as far as they were concerned, they didn't, they didn't exist. They didn't, so there's no line there. And that is, again, what the Panhandle Project is about, is to color in that line. Now, it would be real simple. All I need is a mark and do it for you right now. I don't have to go out in the mud, but we're going to go out in the mud. Okay, in the state of Florida, here's what you will find. Across that national range you just saw, there are seven subspecies of terrapins. Five of them live in Florida, and three of them only live in Florida. So for a state where no one knows what the name of the animal is, we are the most diverse, we are the, you know, the hot spot as far as diversity. Now, again, abundance, that's totally different. You go up in Maryland, people are tripping over them. They're all over the place. Uh, everybody knows what they are up there. But the Carolina terrapin, as you can see right here, is found in the Jacksonville area. It actually goes on up the coast. The mangrove is a Florida terrapin. The Mississippi is not. That's the one that's found here. The Florida terrapin is down here on the southwest coast, and the ornate, which is Shelly, she's found from the Florida Keys all the way up to uh, Choctahatchee Bay. And it's real interesting. You look at all the different guides and, and publications on the range and distribution of terrapins across the United States. It's always fun. It's, they, they draw the line in the middle of the Choctahatchee Bay, right where the Middle Bay Bridge is. The ornate lives on the Walton County side, and the Mississippi only lives... On, on the Pensacola side, and I guess the Terrapins know that they're not allowed to cross that line. <laughs> but yeah, as, as a buddy of mine said, well, remember, Rick, uh, turtles don't read books. So uh, even though this says this is where they are, and again, that's part of our project as well. But here in our area, in the Pensacola Bay area, it is the Mississippi Diamondback Terrapin uh, that exists here. And I'll just show the difference. I got both. And I'll see if you guys. And tell the difference. It's pretty easy, I think, right? It's funny though, because when I'm working with volunteers, like I don't know the doing like that. They, it's, this one's very, very dark. Okay. Uh, this one's got a much lighter head. I call this the nape. If you look between the eyes, the nape of this one is white. This one is black. You guys can see that. That's, this is Malcolm, by the way. And there's a cool story about Malcolm. We're going to come back. Malcolm's got a very interesting history. But you'll also notice the spots in each skew here on the shell, the carapace, that this one does not have. So one of the things that we're trying to do, is this true? This one lives in Walton County, all the way to Key West, will not come to Fort Walton. This one starts at Fort Walton. It goes all the way to the Texas state line. And right there, it's the same thing. There's a line drawn in the sand. You know, once you get from Louisiana to Texas, no, 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 you got to back out. Over there, they got the Texas here. So this is the difference between the Mississippi and the Orney. And again, I'll come back to that in just a second because that is a piece of what we are trying to do with the Terrapin Project. Uh, as far as the conservation of this animal, we get into this. Uh, you know, terrapins were real abundant in the Chesapeake Bay area, uh, and it started really with President Abraham Lincoln. I mean, when they started setting up, and a lot of presidents have done this, when they do state dinners, they always want to serve one course is traditional American. You always might remember Franklin Roosevelt uh, grilled hot dogs for the Queen of the Queen Elizabeth outside. I don't know if you guys remember that. He was outdoors, you know, he did the bun and the whole nine yards. Everybody's like, you're really going to feed the Queen hot dogs? <laughs> yeah, it's America. Well, President uh, Lincoln decided to serve terrible, and it became cool. Everybody wanted these things now, all of a sudden. Uh, so this was the dish, uh, and then there was a huge uh, uh, rush out there to harvest these things. Prior to it becoming popular, uh, it was primarily slaves that went out to eat these things. And they would go into Chesapeake, they would have a burlap sack, a, a pole with a spike on it, and they would go through barefoot just feeling for rocks. 
when they found one, you pop it and you would bring up the terrapin, put it in a burlap sack, and they could sell a sack of terrapin for about 10 bucks. That was sort of normal. When it became vogue and very popular, they could get as much as $100 a sack. So everybody had a sack, everybody's out there. And so all of a sudden there was a huge demand of this thing and the numbers started dropping to the point where they actually got into aquaculture. They started growing terrapins in farms. Uh, here you can see a terrapin farm here. This lady's uh, feeding the things. Uh, but here's, here's how they used to do it, you know, before they got into the farming thing. Um, but yeah, and it turns out a lot of the terrapin farms were here in the South. A lot of them were North South Carolina. There was one in Mobile Bay at Cedar Point Marsh. They had a terrapin farmer over there. And it was to supply the demand up there because people here are like, we don't eat these. You know, but here we got them. So but that, that recipe said two can, small cans. So they actually canned it at yep. some point too? Yep. Oh. Now, again, you don't really see this much anymore. Uh, primarily what happened was about the turn of the century, the, the the demand was high, but the quantity was low. So the price went high. People just couldn't afford it. And so they just quit eating terrapin. Uh, it's still, it's kind of like here. As a matter of fact, I heard just last week somebody was out there hunting gopher tortoise uh, here locally. Uh, so even though, you, and I've talked to folks who've done this, some of the old timers, like, man, this tastes so good. It tastes like chicken. I said, well, you know, this is full of chicken. chicken. <laughs> you don't want to go dig because it's got to be a lot of work to clean this up. Uh, so there are still some folks who will eat it, and each state manages that different, and it's still very popular with the Asian. Uh, culture, they they still enjoy eating it. So in some parts of, of the country, it's still it's still a food item. But that, for the most part, kind of went away because of price. Uh, and that's when the research stepped in, because at that point, no one was really paying attention to this thing. But after you know uh, the, 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 the huge pressure on harvesting these things, uh, most universities said, "Let's go out there and find out what impact this has had on us." And that's when most of the publications started coming out about this turtle called the terrapin. Okay, and then in the mid 20th century, this thing came out. It's called a crab trap. It's the correct word actually is crab pot, but I'm never, ever, ever going to try to change your mind on that. <laughs> uh, the crab trap, and many of you uh, remember this. It was you would lay it down. It was string, and you had a chicken or something in there. And when the crab went in, you pulled it up. That technically is a crab trap. This technically is a crab pot. But everybody calls it a crab trap. And we tried to make that change and realize you're, you're not communicating with the public. Just call it a crab trap and go with it. But these things came out. Obviously, if you know anything else about the Chesapeake, particularly the Baltimore area, blue crabs rule. That is number one. I mean, shrimp is big here. Blue crabs rules up there. And when they started using it, this was obviously a much better way to do crab fishing. Terrapins go inside. Okay, They will swim inside of these things. And they unfortunately drown. They're reptiles. They can hold their breath for about 30 minutes to an hour, but when they're inside a crab trap, they're stressed. We find that they drown as quickly as 16 minutes because uh, they're breathing very, very <coughs> fast trying to figure out how to get out of it. This is a crab trap found here in the Pensacola Bay area. And there's five dead terrapins in there. So this had become a problem. Now we got another conservation issue. People were eating them. Now it's getting into the crab trap. How are we going to deal with this? Are you going to go and tell the crab fishermen in Maryland you're no longer going to do blue crab? No, you're not going to do that. So you got to, and actually the researchers and the fishermen work together to come up with an idea or a plan on how to deal with this problem. Um, I read um, one crab trap in Virginia, one crab trap, 40 terrapins. And when you see how big they are, and the crab fishermen were angry about that. He goes, that many turtles inside one trap, I'm not catching any. I'm not catching anything. So we've got to come up with a plan on how to deal with this. And here's the plan. Now, I did not bring the box up. I will let you guys know here in just a minute. I have a case of these downstairs. These are called, well, I remember when they first started talking about this. Some of you might remember the whole Ted's thing with the sea turtle. And it was, I was working at Dolphin Sea Lab at the time. It was not pretty. Uh, the shrimpers were not happy about this at all. There was a lot of repercussion things that I won't even get into that happened over in Alabama. But when this thing came along, I said, are you going to call this a TEDS, which was a turtle excluder device? And they went, no, <laughs> we are not going to go down that road again. We're going to call it a bird. Eye catch reduction device. This is it. So they started working with them in New Jersey, Dr. Um, I can't remember his name right now. Uh, but anyway, I uh, started working with the fishermen up there, and they were using coat hangers, trying to look for the right shape, size, round, whatever, because, again, they did not want to stop the blue crabs. And they came up with this, uh, four by two inches. Uh, you can see how you strap it into the funnel of the opening right here. 
like so, and the terrapin cannot get through, but the crabs can turn sideways and they still get in. Obviously, that sounds great. They did multiple studies up there and found that it kept 80 to 90% of the terrapins out and it did not significantly change the crab harvest at all. Matter of fact, one study showed that the number, the size of the crabs actually increased and all the crab fishermen give me those things, yeah. you know, but they didn't do it here in Florida, by the way. Uh, the response from the state here was, well, all right, that's the Chesapeake. Does it work here? And so there's been a lot of studies going on here in the state of Florida to find out that the results work out the same. And the quick answer to that is yes. And starting March 1st of this year, 2023, these are now required on all recreational crab traps in Florida. Not everybody knows that yet. I have a case of them downstairs. If anybody needs them, you can call the extension office. You can come out and pick them up. They're free. Uh, you do need one for each hole. I have heard about, this is a fish excluder device that, that's been required for a while. Uh, I have heard people talking about cutting a new hole to put this in, like, don't do that because, oh. yeah, don't, 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 don't cut a hole in <clears throat> your trap. But that is the bycatch reduction device, the BRD or the birth. So that is another issue. This one's one we don't see much here. What's happening is that with development, a lot of these high dry ground sandy beaches that they come out of the marsh looking for to lay their eggs are very popular with the public as far as a place to live. Because you wanna live on the high dry sandy spot too. You don't wanna live in the muck and the mire. So as they develop these sandy locations around our estuaries, the terrapins are then forced to find other places to lay eggs. And in the Chesapeake area, this has become a huge issue, even in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. Uh, I know in South Carolina, I went to Jekyll Island. They said they had over 350 turtles, terrapins that had been hit by cars. And what they're doing is they're coming up on the highway because in a salt marsh, as you can imagine, they're building up the land so that you can put the road. The terrapins say, this looks good. Um, and so, unfortunately, there's there's a lot of roadkill. Uh, we don't see that much of that here in Florida. Again, it's a bigger issue up there. But as you guys know, it may end up being an issue here eventually. We don't know. Um, this is why I would say here locally, this is probably one of our bigger problems, and it's a natural predator, raccoons. They will come out on the beaches, uh, and they dig up about 80 to 90 percent of the nests. Uh, so they, they are, there was actually a study done at the University of North Florida where they removed all the raccoons from a barrier island uh, to see how nest success went. It sky with almost 100% success, but the raccoons showed up very quickly after that without, you know, it didn't take long for them to figure out how to get back. So they said, okay, yes, the raccoons are causing, they're a big impact, but how are you going to manage that? I mean, you're going to remove raccoons every year. You're not going to do that. So it's something that we know it's there. We know it's an issue. Uh, and we're seeing others. I will tell you, there's a, an interesting story, and that has to do with Malcolm. This is Malcolm right here. Um, I got a call last year, I believe it was, last year or the year before, uh, from a gentleman who is one of the guards at the EPA lab. And he said, you're Rick O'Connor, right? And I said, you're the Terrapin guy. Well, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, they keep falling on the roof of our guard shack here at the <laughs> EPA lab. We hear them hit the roof, and when we look out, they're laying in the street. And most of them are okay and we let them go. We usually hold them for a little while. But I've got one who's not acting right. He's, he's, he can't find the food. He's acting a little crazy. Um, and then he would say, what do you want him? And I said, back up just a second. You say they're falling out of the sky? <laughs> because I've been walking around out there in that muck and mire and that mud looking like all I need to do is sit in a chair with a glove and catch them. You know? like and we made a long story short, we've been trying to figure out what's happening with these guys. This is the answer. Crows. Crows will come and dig them up. They will take the hatchlings and they will drop them on buildings to try to crack this shell so they can feed them to their fledgings. And yeah, all the guards were telling me, they, because as I started talking to them more, they always happens in the afternoon, usually between 4 p.m. and 10. He said, that's usually what happens. And it only happens for a few weeks out of the year and it goes away. And then he started noticing the crows and we put two and two together. Now we're trying to figure out where the crows are going to get those terrapins. I don't know where they're coming from. We think maybe Shoreline Park is where these things may be coming from. But Malcolm cannot find food. So Malcolm is now an education animal and he cannot find food. I'll put it right in front of his face and he's just like, oh. but he's a great guy. He's cute. He does have a hard time finding food. We got to feed. So these are all becoming issues. We are having issues with all of these. The pet trade, I told you about that too. And it's very, very lucrative. Uh, again, the one gentleman was uh, arrested about two or three years ago now. We don't know exactly where he got the terrapins from. He had a pickup truck full of them, $17,000 in cash in his pocket, and he was in the panhandle. We don't know where. Uh, but they, they collect these things. They turn around and sell them. All of it's illegal. Now, to stop this problem, prior to this, 
you can have two terrapins in your possession. The state would allow that. Uh, as of March 1st, 2022, that's now illegal. You cannot possess a terrapin now, unless you have a permit, if you're an education facility or something like that, a zoo, something like that. Uh, and again, somebody may have had one of these things since they were a kid, like, you can't take Bob away. You know, okay, we'll give you a permit. You can have that. But they're not going to issue any new ones uh, because it's it's a fine line between I'm keeping it as a pet and I'm selling it overseas. And, and overseas seems to be the big market for these things. So that is now another thing that we're having. And by the way, as I go through this thing, uh, we don't really talk too much about where we're actually finding them for that reason. We have found, uh, when I say we, the Florida Diamondback Terrapin Working Group, it's found that uh, a lot of these poachers listen to us online, and um, they also come to a lot of the big conferences, and we don't even know they're there, and they're just taking pictures of every beach, and the next thing you know, there they are, and they're out there with their truck, and they know exactly, we're telling them where to go, you know, to get these things, so we're being very, very careful uh, when we're, especially on Zooming or something like that, what we're saying and where we're going. All right, so you remember this? We talked about that earlier. That leads us now to the Panhandle Terrapin Project. And the primary objectives that we have for this project, number one, do they even exist here? Because that isn't red. We need to color that line in. Um, what is their status if they are here? What is the status of the animal here? Does it need any kind of protection from the state or anything like that? How are they using the habitat here? Well, I mean, we know what the literature says, but no one even knows anything about terrapins in the Panhandle. Do they use it the same way everybody else does? It? Or do they, do they break the rules? And what is their genetic distribution? One of the things we're interested in, the state has told us that if we can genetically show that the terrapins in Pensacola Bay are truly the Mississippi terrapin and have no genetics from the ornate or Shelley, then they are our candidate for listing in the state of Florida. This is the only bay in the entire state where that turtle lives, the Mississippi diamond terrapin. So that is part of our project is to get some tissue samples to find out if that is in fact the case. So let's look at uh, uh, objective number one. Do they exist here? The answer is yes. We started back in 2005. Started when I was working. I was at Washington High School. We were using Washington High School students to go all over the place, putting up wanted posters on boat ramps all in the more salt marshes. I will say, you know, if you've worked with sea turtles, you hear these things called false crawls, where they come up and they don't lay eggs. I call these false calls. Uh, people would call it, I got your chairman. You'd run out there, it's a box turtle. Or yeah. like, you, know, you had to be polite. The public's trying to help. I, mean, I would take measurements and everything else. You know, I, you know, I, didn't, you know, I didn't want to feel that, but that, that's not the turtle um, that we're looking for. But with that effort, we were able to verify at least one record of a terrapin in every county between here and Apalachicola River. So the answer is yes, terrapins do exist here. I just need to come back with a marker and color that in, and we're good to go. <laughs> We're good to go. What is their status? That's the next thing that you turn. Well, typically what you do to, to get a population estimate, uh, some of you have all gone through biology, so you understand the whole mark recapture kind of thing. One of the things that's always a problem with terrapins is capturing these things. They are extremely elusive. I will tell you, the more we look, the more we're finding. I think they've been here all along. People walk right by them and have no idea they're even there. Um, so they're not easy. They're very, very elusive. Uh, and they're not very easy to capture. So every time I go to the National Terrapin meeting, that's always a discussion. What did you try this time? Everybody's trying everything to try to catch these things. It makes sense to use crab traps because they swim in crab traps. So we do what's called a modified crab trap. You just cut the top of the church off the top of this thing and put PVC, and now the turtle can get up and get a breath of air. And so I would set these things at dawn on a Monday and then pull them on Friday, because as you guys know, you're all rel uh, residents here, weekends, all kinds of things are going on out on the beach. You know, like we don't need a trap sitting out there, you know, big with an orange flag on it, let everybody know what's going on. So let's go check that out. Uh, so yeah, we would do dawn and Monday to sunset on Friday. We would not see hardly anything on Monday. We would catch whatever we were gonna catch on Tuesday. And the rest of the week, this is what we saw. Terrapins swimming all on the trap. They would not go in. It just wouldn't, you know, you just wanted to get the trap and just push it towards it. Just get in there. Now, I did meet a guy. There are actually terrapins in Bermuda. They all live on the water hazards at the golf course. I said, well, isn't that sweet? You just ride around on the golf cart and pick them up. But we're out here in this fucking mire trying to catch them. Uh, we have tried seining. I did read in Georgia and South Carolina. They will pull a 100-foot seine net. They have good luck. We did not catch a single one. Uh, so we are going to try and look for plan B. There's, uh, yeah, I've heard people pull catching them in shrimp troughs. Um, uh, so, I mean, there's different ways of doing it. So what we ended up doing, though, was switching this because it was becoming too hard, particularly for our volunteers, uh, to just looking at relative abundance using what I call the band method. 
And I called the man method because it was developed by Tom Mann, who's a wildlife biologist in the state of Mississippi. Uh, so he and I met in a meeting. We were talking about all this. And I said, oh, this sounds like something citizen science could do. There are some assumptions to the man method. Uh, the man method says basically you believe all mature females in the population are going to nest each season. They don't skip a year. We don't know if that's true or not, but we're assuming that it is true. They, they, every female in the population who can lay eggs will lay eggs every summer. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, number two, all nesting females do so each season. I'm sorry. Why did I write that twice? All nesting females do so each season. Um, oh, um, yes, that we know that all the mature females will nest each season. What I'm talking about is the females themselves won't skip. But those who do come up will do it every single season. And then number three is if they do come up, uh, they will come up more than once. That was deception. That's where I messed up on number two. Number two should say that they will come up and lay more than one nest each season. I left part of it out. We do know that's true. Most terrapins lay two to four nests every season. Okay. But number three, which is the evidence for number three is very strong. Uh, but number three is saying if they do come up and lay eggs, they're not going to lay two nests within a 16-day period. So if you break the nesting season down into 16 days, every female I count during May 1st to May 16th is a different female. And that number of females going with the sex ratio of one to one, double that, that's how many adult uh, male-female terrapins you have. That's kind of the, what we call the relative abundance. Now, we feel pretty strong about this. We are getting data here in the panhandle that is suggesting the sex ratio of terrapins is one to three, one to five males. We're finding more males here. So when I do the relative abundance at the end of our season, I will do it one to one, one to three, and one to five. So the terrapins are somewhere between this and this. So again, we don't know the exact population. Somebody asked me that earlier when they walked in. We, we got a relative idea how many are out there, but we're not 100% sure of the exact definition, I mean, of population. Uh, and that you know where all the nesting beaches are. That's obviously another thing. You're, you're working these beaches, but are you missing some? There may be more terrapins, and I think we are. I think we are missing some of these. Volunteers, this is what the citizen science volunteers do. And if you're interested, we'll talk about that if you want to do this next year. We wrap it up now at the end of September. Um, and I'll talk about that. I started, when I first started, I did April through June. USGS, my partner now, wants me to push them to September. I'm getting a lot of kickback on that, especially in August. You guys remember when August was like, get out there. Like, no, I'm not going. No, it's okay. I wouldn't go either. Uh, so, yeah, between, uh, they try to visit these primary nesting. Now, what we call a primary nesting beach is one that we absolutely know for sure they're nesting at. We know they're nesting at. So, we want to volunteer on that beach at least once a week. More if we can, but at least once a week. Uh, between April um, and, and the end of June. They record the number of tracks, how many depredated nests, that's how many nests have been dug up by crows or raccoons, and how many live terrapins if you find. There's all of this is on the data sheet. They complete all of that. We can use that now. We've added also to the data sheet recently human activity. A lot of these terrapins in our area are nesting in places that people don't go. But now people are going there. Everybody knows about Crab Island. Well, Crab Island's getting uh, crowded, and they're beginning to move to some of these other isolated islands in, in the area. And as they move to these, and we're now noticing that, is that impacting nesting? Are we seeing the abundance actually drop? Is it bother? I'll tell you another thing we didn't even know was going to show up this year on one of the islands. One day, 24 Canadian geese landed. And they started laying eggs all over the place. Like, well, what the terrapins think about geese? We'll see. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, the um, presence of invasive plants. We are seeing Phragmites and a couple of others begin to grow on these sandy beaches here. They've got to have something like this. And maybe we don't have a lot of development in a place like this, but if this gets covered with Phragmites, they're going to have to find another place to go lay eggs. Are they going to start going to highways? Are we, are we moving in that direction? So we got them doing that. And if time allows, they look for secondary beaches. We got them focused on where we want them to go, but they can go, hey, Rick, I think they might be over here. Take a, take a shot. Make sure you get that primary beach first. But when you got time, go check those secondary beaches and see what you can do. If we find a live terrapin, as our volunteer Randy here did, you know, we got standard metrics that we collect. How big is it? The shell, the width, the height. We get the mass. We measure the side of her head. Her, the female's heads are real wide because they got to crush those shells. So we get that. Sex determination, and I'll show you how to tell those apart. You will find this is the case in just about all the my turtles. You see the long tail on Malcolm versus the short tail? Malcolm's a boy. Um, Shelly's a girl. 
So you can look at the tail. So we get sex determination. And again, that's for our research on the ratios. So we get that information from them. Uh, we will put a pit tag in them. This is like chipping a dog. Uh, we will get tissue samples at the genetics. We're trying to look at, you know, RNA versus Mississippi. What do we have? And you get the tissue between the fingers. They got wet feet. You just take a little snip of it. It's fine. They're, they're, they don't even cry. <laughs> it's like getting an earring. It's fine. <laughs> Marginal shell notching. That is something we did when I was in school. You would, we didn't have pit tags. You would take a triangle file on each marginal skewed, which are these, each one of these are numbered. There's a number pool. And this side is the tens, this is the hundreds, that kind of thing. So let's say I wanted to label this one 501. You would come up here, notch five. You would find this thing, take that triangle file. You would put a notch in that. So you end up with 501, and that's how we used to tag them before pit tags. Obviously, the pit tag is a lot easier and better on the turtles. But what we found is that the poachers do not like notched turtles. It spooks them. So I said, we're not teams. We're going to do it. So we're putting a pin tag in it, but I tell them we're, we're going to not trust. Uh, let's see if we can just maybe save a couple of them from that. And then the large females, if we got a big one, we'll put a satellite tag on them. That's to see, are they staying in the marsh? Are they just hanging around? Are they moving? And so what you'll see here by county, um, the primary beaches that we're focused on now, we got eight between here and Okaloosa. I am also working... We don't have anybody working Walton right now, but we do, somebody just started this year in Bay and we have a, a team in Gulf and Franklin, but my partner over there, Dan Catazon, kind of oversees uh, that. So I don't have the numbers for that. This is what I'm responsible. And we just added Baldwin County. They are now, they now have a team and they've already found one. What's interesting about Baldwin County is in the literature, they said they were there historically, but no one has seen one in decades. And the team went out and they found one within a week on it. So now they're ready to go on and go to the full program to, to move to objective two. Here are the secondary beaches they're looking at. So we got a, 20, a total of 20 sites or 20 beaches that we're currently monitoring over here. Uh, you see here the number of sites, how often people encounter. Uh, I, I track that. How many times you go out to a beach, do you actually see either a track or a nest? Some kind of indication that terrapins are here. Uh, and I calculate what I call frequency of recurrence. How many surveys, how many encounters. And you'll see here roughly about a quarter of the time, 25% of the time they go out and they find something. Okay, so now we're watching that. That's another metric we can use if that number changes over time. You know, are you encountering them less? Are you encountering? Now I will say we have noticed an increase in encounters, but part of that is kind of like the manatee thing. You know, are you just getting better at finding them or are there actually more terrible? So now that they're getting pretty good at identifying these things. Uh, and here's some of the numbers as how it looks over uh, over time. We'll see here 2008 uh, is where I started this, but you'll see about 35. Then we got 80. That was really interesting. This was at Willsville here. We had never seen so many terrapins, except you know, people like, well, where are they running? Well, I don't know. I really have no idea, but uh, just a lot of terrapin activity that particular year. And then you'll see it got kind of low. This is when I started using, we started expanding and using new um, volunteers. And again, I, I, I'm not throwing a red flag right there. It's like, all right, we got to teach them how to find these things. Uh, they're not recording a lot because I, I think they're walking around. Matter of fact, I got out with a volunteer once on the beach. He said, man, Rick, can you come help me out? And I got out and there was a track that goes right there. He goes, if you had not pointed that out to me, I would have walked right by it. So then you start thinking like, all right, how many, how many are getting missed? So as we, as we work with our volunteers, they're getting better and better. How are they using the habitat? As I said, this is an interesting thing here. Everything I just told you earlier, uh, they like estuaries. This terrapin was found in the Gulf of Mexico by one of the sea turtle volunteers. And that's not the first time that has happened. So we're all asking the question, do they use the Gulf more? I know what the book says, but remember turtles don't read books. Uh, so are the panhandle terrapins like breaking ranks from the rest of the world? Like I'll do what I want to do if I want to go in the Gulf. So we're trying to figure that out. Looking at this one, would you call this one a Mississippi or an RNA? Got the black, that would be Mississippi. White, like Shelly, that's the RNA. So this one would be the Mississippi. That would be the Mississippi. And here's a track. This is actually on one of our barrier islands here, and she's heading off into the Gulf of Mexico. She was on her way out. The National Park Service found that, and uh, she was on her way to the Gulf. So we tagged a couple of them. Uh, USGS tagged one in Fort Walton Beach. It swam to Oriole Beach. That was over 30 miles. And we're like, whoa. And then they tagged one in Big Lagoon. She crossed the island, went into the Gulf of Mexico, and went to Mobile. 
So we're like, all right, we got to tax more. We got to find out. If, you know, we've just got completely different uh, tariffs here. Uh, so far, we've tagged three this year, and they are doing. They're just they're not going anywhere. <laughs> So we got to do some more of that. This was a terrapin found by my predecessor, Andrew Diller. I don't know if anybody ever knew Andrew. Andrew was a sea turtle guy. And he goes, oh, Rick, I found one of your terrapins. And of course, you got to remember Lucky. Uh, but this was on the Gulf side. He was on the Gulf side looking for tur sea turtles in there. Well, as a matter of fact, we talk to the sea turtle people every year. Like, if they see one, we need to know. Um, so there we go. Here's the satellite tag. This is what it looks like. Uh, we're, we're using one actually designed for a sea turtle, uh, so we got to get a really big female in order to put that on there. Uh, Dan is actually looking at one that's designed for penguins. Uh, it's a better size maybe for a terrapin, so we may be using some penguin tags. Here's the ones by Paul Walton Burr. I don't remember what they named her, uh, but that's the one I was telling you that went to Oriel Beach. Claire is the one who went to Mobile. Kennedy, Dolly, and Molly were all tagged this year. Uh, so we've got these female, these ladies are all running around out there right now. And we're trying to get an idea of what they do, where they go. Uh, genetic distribution. All right, looking at that one again, this was a deceased one that I found in a crab trap. Uh, looking at that shell, the orange spots. And again, I know I'm quizzing some of you. Would you guys call this one the ornate or the Mississippi? The ornate, yes. And I found that one in Big Lagoon. I found that one in Big Lagoon in a crap trap. So again, I'm thinking right now, she was dead. These were the eggs she had. It was an unfortunate thing. Yeah, we lost all of it. Uh, and she had a periwinkle. <laughs> she had eaten a periwinkle. But um, yeah, I'm thinking when this is all said, the tissue samples we did last year all at UCLA, and we haven't heard back yet. Uh, so we don't know, but there's a good chance. All right, looking at this one, what would you call this is Andrews? Would you call that one a Mississippi or a or an A? Mississippi, yeah. You can't really see the nape. You don't really see the orange spots. And do you notice the mustache? It's kind of cool. I don't know. I didn't point that out. Mississippi. Falcon's going to get mad at me. Well, you can't see his very well. And he has bitten me once. So I'm going to be careful. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell. But yeah, you'll see that little mustache that you can see on Mississippi. Uh, so yeah, we think that was a Mississippi. That was near Big Lagoon as well. How about that one? This one, actually, you can't see the orange, but that big mustache right here. This one was over in Big Lagoon, um, but that one, we believe, was in Mississippi. And again, tissues of all these have been shipped off, so we'll find out. Something tells them we've probably got hybrids. How about that one? Morning. Yeah, you see that white right there? That was also in Big Lagoon. That one's lost. Have they studied whether they interbreed? With they do. That's the thing. We think that's actually probably what we're going to find. Yeah. Is in a room, which unfortunately what it means is FWC is going to say, well, we're not going to stop. <laughs> uh, so what do we know about terrapins right now? We know they exist here. They are here in the Florida Panhandle. The relative abundance is around 50 to 100 on each of these primary beaches is roughly how many we believe we have. We don't know the exact number. Uh, some move more than literature supports. They do move around a lot, some of these. And again, we need more tags and follow more satellite tags to see what Molly and Dolly and the rest of them are going to do. Actually, Dolly was an interesting story. The guy you saw, Bob Piss, that was a guy who found Dolly. So he got the name of us. He goes, I'm going to call it Dolly. I said, well, why? He goes, well, it reminds me of my grandmother. She's got a big wide jaw and a mustache too. Oh. <laughs> so we'll go with Dolly. So we're going to see what Dolly ends up doing. Uh, that one's over at Fort St. Joe. That's where we got that one. Uh, what do we do not know? We don't know a lot. We only, we haven't estimated their population. We don't know the exact numbers. It's obviously the state would want to know that. We don't know where all the nesting beaches are. Uh, we're not 100% sure on the genetics. Everything I just told you, I'm feeling that we're going to end up with hybridization. So I think that's what's going to happen. And they travel a lot more than we think. Um, those are things that we're going to do. So how can you get involved if you want to be part of the team? Uh, volunteers that go out. We have teams in the Scandia, every county, basically. In the plan and now Baldwin County, uh, Baldwin County, Alabama. So we have a whole team of volunteers. Uh, the more volunteers, the better, because you only have to go out once a week. And if you've got a whole team, that doesn't mean you have to go out once a week. Somebody, you know, you, they'll set up a calendar. Each county has a site coordinator. This is Bob Blaze right here. He's our coordinator for Santa Rosa. But it's his job to kind of coordinate all those and uh, get that taken care of. So we generally do our trainings in March. We start surveying in April. We're going to have a meeting Wednesday with the other coordinators. They are all going to want me to push that we end in June stuff this September thing. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, but this is this is the weird thing about the September thing. Uh, July is the busiest time for big lagoons. We see more interaction and more nesting going on. So if we stop at the end of June, we'll miss everything. You know, we'll just have to convince them to go longer, even though it's 108 degrees and the humidity is whatever it is. 
brought me to tear. Get up there. All right. <laughs> That's it. I don't know if you got any questions. I don't know how we're doing on time. We're doing yeah, good. We've got time for questions. Okay. All right. I'll start with you. Uh, what percent of the terrapins you're finding in the Pensacola Bay system are ornate? That's a good question. I haven't crunched the numbers. Just kind of going off memory and thought, I would say it's better than 50% Mississippi. But again, I would actually have to go through and look at those numbers. I have not done that. It's a good also, question. On that one, are you finding any other subspecies? <laughs> no. As far as we know, again, once the genetics comes back, we don't we don't know what we're going to find. Like, oh, well, did you know there's box turtle in here? Too? <laughs> Uh, when do their eggs hatch? They hatch uh, the, the nesting season. It's just like sea turtles. Okay. Uh, they begin the earliest, and we're actually, this, that's a good question. The earliest record I had early on when I was still in Washington was uh, April 25th. So I was kind of sending my volunteers out mid-April because I didn't want them to waste their time. But now we have found them as early as April 6th. And there's a whole movement with the national team. Every year, Russell Burke, Dr. Burke up at Hofstra University in New York says, all right, everybody report their first nest each year because what we're seeing is a shift. Climate's changing. And so the terrapins are changing. And so that's been an interesting thing. So now they may be even moving into March. Uh, uh, but typically they will start nesting early April. The peak is late May, early June, and then it starts to drop off, which has been my argument that once we get to July, and it's brutal thunderstorms and 100% humidity, where your probability of finding something is low. But we are, as I just said, on some some of these beaches, actually it starts going up that time. So, but um, now as far as when does all the hatching end, it usually ends like sea turtles this, this time of year. Most of the babies are coming out. But interesting thing I did, I didn't share with you, baby terrapins do not run to the water like sea turtles. They hide on the beach. They hide under the rack, they hide under boards, any any debris, they, they, they don't go to the water. They'll spend most of their first year on dry ground. And they are cute. I didn't put a picture. Baby terrapins are really cute. Obviously, sea level rise is a thing, but this year I've noticed the water level is just higher on average. Have your volunteers noted that or have you seen that? Well, we'll effect? see. Unfortunately, I wish I had data from this year. They're still turning it in. We're not to the end of September and I've got to give a talk October 12th and I got to crunch it. So I'm trying to push them to get those data sheets in. Is that a bit price? But yeah, they have note sections in there which they will make comments on how they're beaching. I will say two things on that. I will say there have been a couple of what we would call classic primary beaches that are no longer used because the beach is gone. It's literally some of those are along the intercoastal. Uh, the sand is just gone and the terrapins have abandoned and we don't know where they're at. Uh, another one though, there is a new beach that was formed during Hurricane Sally over on the west side of Escambia County. They love it. They absolutely love it. It wasn't even there. One of our volunteers just went out there for kicks and giggles and he saw tracks and eggs and that's where Dolly came from. So where we're seeing some loss, we're seeing some growth. But if you look at the national, whether the national meetings and discuss all across the range, you're seeing more loss. And so that has become a discussion. What they're going to do is they're going to move to highways or backyard. I mean, they're going to start looking for that. And we don't know where, where that's going to be. We don't know what will happen. Yes, What's the amount of time on the incubation and why are there more males than females? Okay. Uh, the incubation time is 60 to 70 days, same as a sea turtle. Okay, and the egg is, the sex determination is determined by temperature, just like a lot of other turtles. And so I always like to ask that question. When they dig a hole and they put the eggs at the bottom, the ones at the bottom of the nest are cold, dark, and different to the world. Those would be the boys. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's the boys. It's the, boys. <laughs> the girls have a sunny, warm outlook on them. Um, and so, yeah, one of the things they're watching now with climate is the warming of the nest, and are we going to see a shift back? Andrew Diller, who worked with sea turtles, found the same thing with sea turtles up here. And because it's colder in the panhandle, we produce more males. And that's why we see fewer sea turtle nests up here. I mean, you know, what we had 16, 20, so we didn't have very many this year at all. And then my colleague down in St. Martin, they had over 1,100 turtles of one county, turtle nests, sea turtle nests. But that's where the women are. That's where the females are the ones coming to lay the eggs because it's warmer now. So typically up here, we see more males and less females. I don't know if that's the case or the reason for terrapins, but that's the explanation I've been given for sea turtles. So it makes sense terrapins would fall in line. So we'll find out whether that shifts or not. They are my matter of fact, I didn't tell you that we have temperature lockers on our nest. We are looking at the incubation temperatures to find out is it warmer than it's typically. Yeah. 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 Y
And when uh, you see a bunch of turtles on in a pond or something, will they intermingle? Yeah, they will. Yeah, and then some uh, uh, the different species or subspecies rather are like subspecies of a lot of other animals. The red-eared slider, you might be familiar with that, which is not native to Florida. Uh, they were brought here. You're not allowed to sell native turtles in the state of Florida. So they were bringing non-natives in from Mississippi, the red-eared slider, and they, they're all over the state of Florida. They're everywhere now. That thing's mean. Uh, so yeah, they will intermingle. And eat that. The red-eared's a, a very aggressive mean turtle and starts running some of the others off. Uh, matter of fact, Shelly, I mean, again, this is just an individual. She got put in timeout. She was being very mean to all the other characters. So she's in a whole other building. <laughs> she's in timeout. She can, she, she can be kind of feisty. But yeah, there's a lot of intermingles going on. Uh, yes, I do see that. Any others? Okay. Again, if you're interested in a BRD, if you need some for your crab traps, again, I've got a case downstairs. I didn't bring it up, but I'll be glad to give it to you now. Or you can come by the extension office, and if you know somebody who is a crab fisherman and they're not aware of it, and you know FWC is going to give them a little bit of a grace period now. They'll start nailing people right away, but eventually they're going to start writing tickets for this. So try to get everybody outfitted before that happens. But thanks for coming. Thank you. I don't have any questions online. If anyone was waiting, feel free to hop on now. And then thank you all for coming. Uh, we do have some other events happening this week that we invite you to join us for as well. Tomorrow we're going to have trivia at Coastal County at 6.30. Um, you're going to get at least one question right from attending this meeting. <laughs> Things you learned. So you can come out and join us then. And then on Friday, we're holding our community grant symposium. So we give out grants to the community um, each year. And our past year's recipients are going to report. So we get to hear about different projects kind of similar to this that have been happening in the watersheds. And then we'll be awarding our new recipients as well. And they'll get to hear what's coming down the pipe this next year. And then on Saturday, we are full, but you can be added to the wait list. People do cancel at the last minute. We're doing a guided paddle at Big Lagoon. So feel free to check those out as well. If you see one of these calls. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't see anyone online, so I'm gonna close that out. I did not bring up the Germex, but I do have a towel. Of this. If anybody wants to pet or hold one, we're more than welcome. Um,